Kathy Vick, Deeply Awake Chats 2017. And I'm a little bit blown away in this moment. I'm riding a high, this wonderful, glowy, golden high that I've only ever shared with one very lucky individual. Um, actually, that's not true. I've shared it with two. And one person got off on it as much as I'm getting off. So that's pretty cool. And the other one said, uh, waiter, check please. <laughs> yeah. It's so, honey, I'm, e I'm either your flavor or I'm not. But uh, you're getting me full strength today. I want to um, honor what I just wrote, what I just created. I'm floored by my authenticity and my sheer joy and my coherence, my legitimacy, my beauty, my seriousness, and how revolutionary I might be seen by some. It's just so I'm walking around at word, you know, sitting here feeling like like a wizard, like a goddess. And I'm riding the power of uh see, I'm I'm doing this transition of uh just smoking occasionally, if at all, when I feel like I want to do that to my body, but not because I have to. And so I don't have any smokes in the house. And this is something that I've been poodling with for about 2 years. But see, whoop, it's empty. I'm only doing American spirit. That's it. That's all I'm gonna do. And I've said that before. And then I've gotten, you know, I haven't, I haven't really been wanting to. And the addiction, because it's, it, I hadn't cracked it yet. And now, woo! I don't have any. And I really don't feel like putting one of those doodads in my mouth, because I would do that and suck on the tobacco. And that gives me a sense of power, personal empowerment, sovereignty. So. I'm not going to run over to 7-Eleven, come back, and then do this video, in other words. I'm going to just sit down and be in this reality where I'm not, um, I'm not doing something in an unthinking automaton way. And it feels so good. So, anyhow. That's a little side note to a video I did on how to quit smoking or anything like that. You just understand that that's not your gig. And you can list the reasons why if you need to. You can go argue along with it and go blah blah, this is why, la 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 la. Or you can just say, yeah, well, I, I guess I used to, I don't know. I just, I don't. But, and then it becomes something that you just don't notice. And so I'm, you know, it's, I'm not there yet. But that's how it's done. That's how I've done it with all the other things. And then I just don't argue with it anymore. And when I want to feel that way or do that, like with Fireball, then I do that because I enjoy this effect and I know that it's harmful, but I do it anyway because I enjoy it. Because I'm in charge and um, I don't have any rules. No, I don't have anybody to answer to. And it, I know what it does to my geometrics. I know what it does to my head, but I enjoy drinking once in a while. So deal with it. I'm powerful enough to be able to handle it. So it's like there's a there's this idea that oh well you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do this, you can't do that. You can't eat meat, you can't do this, you can't do that. Well actually, yeah, I can. Yeah, I can. And that's where I've been for all this time and now I do this um this idea of I'm gonna do a GAPS diet. I'm gonna do a GAPS protocol. Because I am I do have GAP syndrome, I mean that's obvious. <laughs> so obvious and it would be really good to seal my leaky gut it makes sense it's just scientifically very accurate and makes a lot of sense and that means I have to acknowledge that there are toxins in my environment that uh, that really are not my friend and that my physical body can't just magically go poof and change everything and that kind of pisses me off that's part of my preparation to get on the GAPS protocol is realizing that I'm I I don't have I don't have all of the power 
consciously, that I have to work with my body, that I have to monitor what goes into it to some degree, that kind of makes me mad. I want my body to be a little bit smarter than that. Really? I gotta do certain things? Really? Because I know I have an agreement with fluoride and chlorine and you know the stuff that's not good in water. You just that's not hard to change energetically. And so it kind of it kind of that's why it puzzles me the the health thing. Why is my hip hurting? That doesn't make any sense at all. I'm healthy. It's like that. I don't get this. I don't know what it means. Why? And so I've had to plumb the depths, but that's how I appre uh, that's how I approach health. So you can imagine the depth with which I've used this beautiful mind to plumb um, the corridors of sexuality. <laughs> it's not like here, here's here's your assignment. Uh, uh, wh what? Because uh, so here we go. Bisexuality, starting at 612, all right? Because I need to ramble. What I mentioned in that first video is that uh, my the first person who entered my reality with a flower, a gift, and a feeling of love was this, like, I nobody ever knew really what gender she was or it was. One of those. And we had a few of them always in school, didn't you? Is that a boy or a girl? That was always the question. And it's sort of like an open, am I supposed to feel embarrassed about this? And it was just unspoken and all that kind of crap. So I think she was a girl, but she looked like a boy, and I thought that was really cool. And I remember standing on the, on the porch at school, looking up at the heavens, and realizing, well, it really, to me, this is really cool because love is love. Isn't that neat? And I'm so excited. Someone loves me. Isn't that neat? And um, I, I agree with this. This is very nice. And then I brought the book home and I told my mom and she said, uh, return the book and don't talk to her again. And that's what I did. That was shitty. But that was what I grew up in. And that's what 50-year-olds grew up in, guys. It, the people, kids today who are sniping at each other because they're not doing their sexuality right and they're like parsing each other's sexuality <laughs> insane you're able to do that because people like me who had questions and didn't fit struggled with it and got together with others and started something started talking and started uh, having some pride and feeling feeling good instead of less than. Feeling not more than, but valid. And um, so when I uh, mentioned, when I talked about bisexuality, I did mention that from early on I, I, I had, I, I was just sort of like built that way. It was like, what's everybody all upset about, you know? I mean, yeah, everybody's got different genitals, but um, but we're all looking for the same thing, right? And that, of course, was anti everything that I was going to be given. That you know, I needed to wear pastels, <laughs> and I needed to act a certain way. I needed to figure out how to please a boy, and you know, because I didn't. Because <laughs> um, so. This brings up how I'm made because I've always, I'm just kind of dude-like. I'm less maternal than paternal in my mind and in my just, you know, tomboy and all that. And I, but I early, 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 early knew that I had been a, a man. I mean, that was one of the first things I knew. And I really resonated with being a man. And I found it peculiar. I was in a female body. And I understood at an early age that I the the my boobs are really big, and um, that that was a that was purposeful because I needed the daily reminder and I needed others to treat me as female, and to see me as female, and it, obviously it's accentuated because I don't behave that way, 
and so my relationships with men have always been kind of odd too. And there's always this zone of, I really shouldn't be doing this. <laughs> it's like, what? And dudes feel that too. It's like, I really shouldn't be. I, this, this, this. And it's like, yeah, well, okay. It's because there's, there's a mixture here. And um, when I went to the teachers, they explained about the Merkaba and the physical body because the physical body is the tissue representation so to speak the, the representation of the energetics it's it's an expression one out <laughs> of a ton but the one you've chosen for this lifetime and so and because I, I i knew about um transgendered stuff and surgery and stuff in my youth i i followed Renee Richards and I was aware of that because I thought that but I decided that I mean here I am so it looks like this is my karma to figure this shit out <laughs> it led me to learn about reincarnation it was something that spurred me on is trying to understand this so 11 11 so now I hear kids talk about this and it's, and it's a completely different ball of wax. So for me, I sought out answers that seemed to make sense, but were, were that spoke my language, which was energetics and spirituality and something that's cosmic, kind of. And what I learned was that females, if you've got a female biology and your Merkaba is stationed female, then you're going to be... Uh, heterosexual and if you're stationed male you're going to be homosexual I mean it's just sort of a key and then what you do with it's your business and there's a, there's any number of ways of expressing that that's what the continuum talks about and um, but there is break and they said that they saw me shifting all the time that I wasn't making a decision and they said you need to make a decision it's energetically very exhausting to keep open at that level and, um, but I, I decided to, to, I couldn't decide. <laughs> so I remained open. And so I lived 10 years um, without uh, having any significant male contact and having uh, many significant female uh, sexual relationships. Uh, one in which we were talking about getting married, actually two of them, and one in which we were, gonna, we were talking about having kids. And uh, I decided that lifestyle was not, that, that life was not going to be something I could do long term. Because although I liked the idea of um, there is no such thing as marriage, and you stay with something as long as it's alive and, and feeding both of you, something other than poison. And once it becomes poisonous, you realize it's time to move on, or you're going to perpetuate something that's going to be harmful to everyone it touches. That's what I learned in the gay community. And um, I liked it, but I didn't like that I would. I was expected to have a stereotypical arc, and I, I didn't know how to be an individual, and it became very heard to me, and I didn't like it. So, and I decided that I, I, I felt as if I hadn't integrated my understanding of the male. I always felt like the male was foreign, it, and to me, to this day, I don't really understand what that's all about and I think that's a way to function within this reality having uh, lived so many fresh lives male I had one female life before I came into this one but was only a child and I didn't live very long and um, but it was a way to get in a way to get familiar and that helps because the first lifetime is the hardest but that was that was like in the 40s so I didn't have much time to turn around that's why I was so tired when I came in and it was harder for me in many ways because I was I'd done a quick turnaround and um, that was explained to me early on and it's what I understand and makes sense because there's a f soul fatigue I have that comes over me that I, I, it, that I can't move it, it's just debilitating and this soul fatigue, um, I would say, in my youth, I'm tired. And that's what it meant. It was just too much. I didn't know how to process any of it. And through the years, this soul fatigue has relieved itself from me. But it, I have visitations at times. I can be triggered into that. And I know that that's more of an existential depression. 
but it's also a function of my amnesia. It, it tells me that I am in a pocket of amnesia. It's very painful and incredibly dark. So, 1515. So, the idea behind all of this is that um, for me recently I've realized that um, because there is this dissonance, because there is this non-recognition and non, I, I do not resonate with the male psyche. I don't, I'm so glad I, I, I didn't incarnate male right now because it, it, it's anathema to me, the psychology of it and uh, the energy of it, the, the, the deep patriarchy and the, and the misogyny that's just part of it and the, it, it's just, and it, it's argued against but it's just obvious and um, the, just the, all the blind spots and the pain and how much work these fellows are going to have to do. Oh my gosh. Mm. How much work we all have in front of us. So I'm glad. I'm glad. The karma is different. When you're on the side of the oppressed. Than when you are on the side of the oppressor. The karma is different. And believe it or not. When you're oppressed, the karma is lighter. So, although it's uncomfortable for both, it's far more difficult for the one perpetrating than the one being perpetrated against. And I do have to say that in this environment, there is some of that. The, the male psyche is a very predatory. You just go into, go into a sex club and try and have dinner. Just, you know, and, and not be brought down into the dungeon. Go into a, a bar. Same thing. You pray. And it may, maybe no one approaches you. But it's about appearance and it's about um, being picked off and about being chosen. And it's, it's prey. And predatory and prey. I don't resonate with that. And so these are things that are deep, aren't they? Multi generational karmic. And having to do with reincarnation and things that the Western person um, hasn't considered yet and likes to um, minimize as magical thinking. Aww. But I contend that it has a lot to do with sexuality and with sexual imp expression. And I think that th this is a time of switching. It's a time of, of some sexual... Um, it's, a, it's a, certainly a sexual revolution, and you can see it especially in the youth. So for me, I, I finally made a choice. I finally realized that for me, I, I am keyed as, um, as, a, as homosexual. I mean, that's my, that's my uh, like energetic orientation and where my comfort is, where my, where my normalcy is. Uh, that's how I feel normal. But I reached out and tried to understand, and I have great understanding, not only of the male psyche, but the male heart, which um, I didn't think existed. That's one of the problems I had, is I didn't think that men were, had a heart. They were capable of feelings. That was my understanding this lifetime. And so it's been a real education to realize, no, actually they are, they're not like that. They, they have everything. They have hearts. And that's why I'm so glad I got to um, witness and be part of my, my son's life. Because he's been able to soften me. You know, I don't know why I had that, but it was very, 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 very strong. And um, that has something that has helped to um, soften my whole world. And make people feel like friends and for make me feel less threatened in the world and more safe. So um, it's a real good uh, indication, I think, of integration and acceptance to finally, n it's not picking a side that's grotesque. It's acknowledging comfort and um, alignment and balance and expression that is, um, that is in alignment energetically with soul 
and with soul expression. So that's neat. And I think after all of these forays into um, uh, straight relationships and gay relationships, uh, what I'm left with is it's it's really uh, their soul relationships. The, the the moments of sexuality are the are the ones that are indelibly written onto my energetic system. I think you, anybody who has had a sexual intimacy with someone they loved, um, those are sacrosanct moments, and they create decisions to live lives of sacrifice for just another hit of that. The possibility it might happen. How much you need it and deserve it. And that kind of connection, that's a soul connection. And how you choose to then live your life out, for me, I, I tended to just find individuals would walk into my life who I I just clicked with and it was not work I was changed and made better and and broadened and expanded because of these people so for me it, it's kind of weird to just boil it down to you know what I hear now is going on in the community where if you have a sexual ambiguity or biological ambiguity to you, then you get picked at. Are you transgender? Are you going to do surgery? Are you going to do hormones? You should do this. You should do that. You should do this. You should do that. And this litigation going on about what's right and what's wrong and you're not real and I'm not real and like, I guess that, you know, and it's true. Anybody who wants to be like outside of these labels that's a very big threat and it's kind of surprising to me because it seemed to me that homosexuality was a land of the outlaws for a long time and now it's like so picky <laughs> I think not <laughs> so um, it just further proved to me that that what I've learned in my process in this journey the last couple of years when I've um, gone to intentional orgasm classes and acknowledged my innate wizardry with sexual energy and my long, long history as a healer in this art form. That is something that I really have resonated with as I've awakened that there is a long and beautiful tradition of a coherent walk which requires and allows each person to own being a sexual being that the orgasm is good and that sexuality is not something that needs to or even should be categorized relationally that that's the problem we are labeling our sexuality based on who we are with. It's a social structure. So of course, of course, it's encountering difficulty. This is the time of owning one's sexuality and being okay with expressing the way you express and not putting that on anybody. And the realization suddenly that even that person in a wheelchair likes to come and is, you know, allowed that. And um, that's part of who that person is. Whether they are male or female. Ooh. Did your mind just do a flip? I know some people who are quite repressed whose mind is flipping. They got to be, don't you think? So that's how I see it. It's a, it's a part of the structure. It doesn't need to be expressed. And that means it's being expressed. 
I, I go through periods. I I think of myself sexually as sort of a a a monk, and I use my sexuality at, as part of my spirituality. And there are times when I express myself and communicate with my God through my sexuality, and other times when I choose not to. I am talking to myself instead. They're both valid expressions, and I consider celibacy a high art. And it's something a lot of people can't do, and so they make fun of it. If you're not getting it, then you're, you know, whatever. Well, you know, I used to be there too, and plagued, plagued with memories and desires and motivations and needs plagued I, I mean that quite literally just eaten from the inside out with a misunderstanding about what was going on between male and female in these institutions I lived them out I was married for five years. Let's not forget that. And I procreated. I walked away from the lesbian life and um, I decided I needed to get it right with male. That's the pinnacle. That's mental health. That's reconciliation and release. And I've done it. And I understand. And I love male. And I understand the male. But I understand it's just not the right expression for me for the remainder unless a male has certain attributes. And then I can tolerate that energy and they can tolerate me. But um, there have to be adjustments because um, I'm just not, I'm not strictly female. You want to hear the joke? No one is strictly one gender. It's a little bit silly that we argue about it so much. We're both. If I can have rapturous, amazing sexual relations with a female and with a male and enjoy both, I'm living proof and I'm not the only one, and I'm not doing it unconsciously or as an acting out thing. I've given it thought. And there's a purpose behind everything I've done. That's why it's, it really, it used to really hurt me when people in my life would think I was a slut or they'd call me a whore. It's just like, wow. Look where you're at. And you're gonna you're gonna slut shame me when every single sexual contact I've had has been profound and purposeful. Yeah, I've let people stray into my life, but always have I known they're special just for just for making it that far. And those who are willing to engage in that level of discussion with me, to me, are sainted. Maybe they feel that way too. Who knows? <laughs> You'll have to ask them. <laughs> I know. I know that contact with me results in some changes. <laughs> That's why I warn people. I have. I didn't warn the last three. <laughs> figure it, you know, you're gonna figure it out. Da, 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 da. <laughs> yeah, I I pass, I real I pass real good, especially with men because they're not very sensitive to it. <laughs> they don't notice it, and it's not applicable. So why talk about it? So I'm just an average person, and usually they don't even want to know anything more about me than. You know, the basics. And that can be fun to frolic in that land. It's kind of a relief. <laughs> it's, it's very comforting and quieting in a way to be so absolutely invisible. Crazy. It's just crazy.
So it's not really right for me. Yippee. At least I got that figured out. And that's how I want to end because it's like, okay, they told me it was really stressful. You shouldn't do that. You should just pick a side, right? And it's like, fuck you. I'm not going to pick a side. <laughs> I'm going to do it all, baby. <laughs> and I did. And now, here I am. And I'll tell you what. For about the last, I don't know, six or nine months, there's been a, an increasingly large sense of relief and social comfort and um, confidence and friendliness because I don't feel like I'm part of the predator prey thing anymore. It's how I used to function. I saw men as helpers and as potential friends and as, as connectors and as experts and as guides and as people who could do things that maybe I couldn't but not as sec not as sexual partners that, that was out of the question not because I didn't I didn't like dick just because it just didn't seem to make any sense there was other uses and I was certainly not going to say no to a friendship from a male I love men but no, we're not going to be doing the sex thing because whenever I want sex with a man, they don't want to do it with me. They, or, they, or they do and then they run away. So, uh, let's see. Hmm. <laughs> That's not working out so good. So, um, and it's not really about even behaving in a sexual way. It's, it's more of an internal peace and comfort. And I know my story's weird, okay? I know I'm not typical. But I'm glad about that because I see a lot of people struggling with the, you know, I feel like a dude inside and here I've got girl bits. Or I know I'm a female and everybody treats me like a dude and I don't agree. And I need, I need to switch. This is bullshit. Well, you know, I figured I'm going to just have to live with it because um, I signed up for it. And this was something that I would have to figure out. And I went on a quest. Now, this is the fruit of my quest. Bisexuality revisited. And I can say I'm very happy because, I mean, if I, if I meet a lady, I don't care who it is. Here's the, here's the deal. And I did the declaration, so it's just like a done deal. But it just it doesn't matter to me. Because if it is a male, it's going to be somebody who is extraordinary. But if my energy runs smooth with them, and they're um, and it's it's compatible, I can feel it. Well, I'm not going to say no to that. I'm not going to say no to that energy. That to me is the height of arrogance. This is the height of misunderstanding. When you're handed the gift of compatibility and of and of that creative bloom that occurs with mutual admiration and love, and you walk away from that or treat it bad, well, that's sad. You're not there yet. You're not ready for it. Because I believe I'm of the camp that it can be sustained. It's when two healthy individuals get together and decide they love each other and they're not going to put up with each other's nonsense. They're going to love each other and not see their shit as nonsense and accept each other and help each other and support each other rather than try and instruct each other and train each other. And I'm now making that leap with my son. It's, this is, I'm talking about this because it's very fresh in my reality of moving to a less paternal, paternalistic, patriarchal way. And it really does boil down to, you know, daily things and every relationship. And I think it's an integration. I don't think I'm being exclusionary. And I, I really want to, I feel a need to say that. Um... I think there's this, um, I hear the, the remark that when someone is a homosexual, they are, um, it's because they hate the other gender. 
<laughs> it's like, okay, well, um, sit down and we'll have a discussion for about a half hour and then you'll feel dressed down and kind of dumb. But instead, anymore, it's like, yeah, well, whatever. I don't, I don't really feel a need to explain it to anybody. Partly because I've explained it here, thank Christ. So, because um, I think it, it requires or it deserves documentation because it um, does represent a lifetime's worth of reflection and application and um, experience. And not only intersects, you know, the, the sexual uh, communities and the spiritual communities, but, um, you know, what I represent is, is a lot of other stuff too. And so um, that's why I think it was kind of freaked out. How am I going to market myself? Because there's, where's my hook? Where's my, what am I teaching? <laughs> I'm just showing up. And ask me a question, I'll tell you what I think. And um, at this point, I'm not channeling anymore. I mean, I, I get channeled too. And it's them. I mean, I can hear their voice and all that stuff. And I have a lot of information. I get a lot of downloads, a lot of information. But I'm at a place now where I can integrate it and then speak it as me. And I'm okay with that. Think of Matt Kahn. But, um, you know, the stuff that I'm able to access and where I'm able to see, what I'm able to see, where I'm able to go in meditation and in channel in the past, I'm able to do consciously now. And that's why you haven't heard them for a while, because I still am counseled by them, especially when I sit on the pot, I'm in the shower, and drive. <laughs> Those are the three places they like to say, uh, Hello. It's been a while. We have some information. And they're more of a translator, because the information I'm getting is usually just raw data that comes as um, thought groups that I then sometimes don't even need to unpack, but that need to be lived out. So that's a little bit of an aside about how it feels. But I, I do think that um, what I've learned in this process is that sexuality, as far as, as, as long with everything else, is your sovereignty. Let me just reiterate to close what I've learned about sexual energy. What I know to be true. Sexual energy is spiritual energy. It is solic creative force source energy energy. The world was, or whatever. Creation is based on this exuberance, this level of joy, release, bliss, understanding, and sheer acceptance. How much resistance are you able to feel in your, in your brain pan as you're coming? How bad is the world then? That is creative source energy. That's an electrical pulse that goes through you that changes your, your chemistry. It's profound energy and it is creative energy. It is from this that babies are made. Understand micro, macro, as within, so without. It's the dirty little secret that no one talks about. And we each have that power within us, biologically. And we muddy it up with pointing at each other and saying we're not doing it right. And we're not fitting in. Who the fuck cares? Do you know what you contain in your loins? Do you know the kind of power you're connected to? Simply because you have the potential to have an orgasm? That is profound creative energy. And when I've gone into meditations, it is orgasmic. The energy has been orgasmic at times. Sometimes physically so, and sometimes just emotionally so. That's what I've been experiencing. That degree of joy and rapture and bliss in meditative states. To greater or lesser degrees. 
So I think that m litigating other people's expression, well, that's nice. That's what people do these days. That's fine. If you need to label things, fine. Go right ahead. I know what makes me feel comfortable, and I know what I need. And it doesn't mean that you need to need that. It, it means that I'm showing you my process, and then you get to decide how to do it. But owning one's sexuality and letting everybody own their own sexuality and seeing that sexuality is something that's hard won and sacred within each person. Sacred. It really points to how arrogant we have become. That we think it's appropriate to stick our nose into someone else's. But sexual relations is relational. If we don't know who we are, we rely on the other to tell us, and I did, haven't you? And that healed me. To have someone who actually really loved me, would never say the word, but loved me enough to tell me what was beautiful about me, and who would not let me disparage myself ever. And required me to start loving myself, because it was repugnant that I didn't. That's the level of love that I've experienced in this lifetime. And then it came in a container that was uh, difficult to manage long term. Oh well. Have I grieved it? Oh baby. It changed my life. From beginning to end. And it's what I did with it. God only knows what it was done with the other person. I don't know. But when it comes to this level of, um, hopefully, I mean, I see some people going through divorces and it's just like, yeah, well, it's another day. And it wasn't like that for me. Death, yeah, it's kind of like that for me. Not divorce. It, it destroyed me. Because it, relationship was that important to me. And the illusion and the lie was so real to me. And the dysfunction was so great because I just didn't I didn't understand so I've done my work and I'm I'm explaining now a little bit about what I have discovered and bisexuality is part of that I I firmly believe that biologically obviously we're bisexual we can pleasure either sex and it works and you don't need appliances okay it's possible that it's possible is something that needs to be acknowledged what it means and who does who and, and how they decide to live that doesn't matter biologically it's a truth and so so much of this is just people fretting and getting each other's shit but we do that with uh, how we think about God too so why wouldn't we do it with how we how we do it and, you know, there's other stuff. Oh, well, you're happy and I'm not. And, oh, my God, I've had my problems with that. Yeah. <laughs> it's not easy. And, and obviously, socializing, socializing has never been the easiest thing for me, understanding what other is and all that. So what a journey. And on the end of it is just um, really seeing each individual as a soul. And um, that everyone has their own, like I've said, um, th this one meditation, that's how I'll end, is that I saw every single person as their own, as a sun, as their own gravitational force, as their own quantum engine of creation. And they're dragging with them planets. And these planets are not simple planets, they're also suns. They're also creative energetic forces, quantum forces. But they are energetically interwoven um, as actual expressions of that creator son that I'm involved with that each of us are that and if that's so it really makes a lot less sense to label people but to be in polite society I can't give the long explanation I just gave you so I don't talk about it unless it seems like I'm talking to someone reasonable then maybe I will and maybe I won't but there's so much misunderstanding right now that 
it's usually best to just talk about other things because it's very deep. <laughs>